Hello, welcome to another episode of Unfinished Business. You guys didn't think we were ever coming back, did you? Ha ha. But remember, the word is hiatus, so just needed to take care of some business. You know, it always stays unfinished. But now I'm back to you guys and back with some movie theories. I'm so happy to see you guys. I feel like dancing. I got to get to the rhythm, you know? I got to get back into the rhythm of things. Uh oh, uh oh. This week, we are going to talk about, or I should say, I am going to talk about the Final Destination movies. Now, these movies, I'll admit, aren't a guilty pleasure, nor are they a pleasure that just so happen to be guilty. But they're like horror films I actually kind of like. I mean, they're not great pieces of filmmaking, but they're entertaining. And I just want to discuss, you know, maybe why I like them so much and also why I think you should give them a chance. And what is interesting about the first film is that it actually started off as an idea for a X-Files episode, which the creators who wrote and directed the film, James Hong and Glenn Morgan, started off, you know, working on that show. And, you know, they pitched this idea and it kind of stuck, even though it was never used for an episode. So they decided to make it into a horror film that shows a proper respect to even historical B-movie actors and directors. when, Because if you notice, all the characters are either are named after or have some form of their name, uh, uh, the name of a classic director. I know somewhere in the movie, one of the characters named after Hitchcock. Uh, so don't quote me on like, oh, can you name all of them? In the first film, one of the in-jokes is that you kind of know like somebody's going to die when all of a sudden John Denver music starts playing. It's kind of cruel, kind of dark, but just an interesting tidbit. Um, a group of high school students are going on a plane trip to Europe when one of them has a kind of dream or vision that the plane's gonna explode and everyone's gonna die and we get to see it in graphic fashion. So he tries to empty the plane. Now he ends up getting kicked off the plane as well as a group of other students uh, while other students go and then his premonition comes true and everybody's like kind of freaked out and then eventually the survivors of the crash all start dying themselves. Now, what I like about this first film, which is obviously different than the sequels, is that this film at least tries to sell the drama of the situations a little more, instead of just being like, bam, bam, you know, oh, death, uh, you know, leaving, you know, thrilling scenes. It seems like, you know, there's an actual feeling of loss when characters, you know, die, because for the most part, we get to know most of them. Now, I saw this movie in a theater, and this movie was a total surprise, because I thought it was gonna be some typical teenage horror shenanigans, you know, cue like whatever hot band at the time, cue like some gratuitous sex, nudity, and violence. But, and you know, it did star like hot stars of the time, like Devin Sawa. When was the last time you heard that name? <laughs> Allie Larder, Kara Smith, Sean William Scott, yeah, otherwise known to some of you as Stifler. Now, I'll admit, you know, I. Sean William Scott is hard to take seriously. And even in this film, you know, he just makes faces when he's trying to be serious. And I find myself dying. But this was a pretty solid film and it shocked the hell out of me. I saw it twice in theaters because, you know, sometimes you could see the deaths coming, but then other times it would be just like a fluke, you know, be like, oh, this character makes, well, and I don't care if I ever see you again, <laughs> boom, you know? Now the first film, of course, sets, you know, all the precedents for the rest of the film. You know, the gr opening uh, grand massacre that is going to be the big set piece of the film other than, you know, the deaths that eventually come. Now, usually they're all kind of hinted at in the beginning because you see little clues that might uh, give you clues to a character's eventual or how they're gonna die and the funny or not funny but the interesting thing is that this film betrays its mythology because as Tony Todd's character tells us only new life can stop death in its tracks now originally the original ending of the film had uh, you know most of the characters die except for clear rivers and then she ends up uh, being spared uh, death because she is pregnant because her and Alex had a little rendezvous and she has a baby so that's supposed to stop the curse but they didn't go with that ending and the way they do it spoiler alert is that in the end of this film Alex dies he does the Neo he dies but then he's resurrected so thought thinking oh you know death has been either outsmarted or you know they go against uh, death's rules so that now they're all free and safe. But then the ending has a twist. And then we come into Final Destination 2. <laughs> this one starts with a spectacular highway crash. Of course, we see the vision and then 
it's avoided, and you know, we see the highway crash in all of its glory as a vision, and then, you know, it's avoided, and then slowly characters start to die. Since Devin Sawa had contract, uh, you know, he basically wanted more money, and they were like, you know, to hell with you, allegedly. So uh, the only one who comes back for this film is Clear Rivers, played by Ali Larder. Now, of course, you know, they explain Alex's death, but they give him the lamest death ever. Now, we've watched all these films and watched how intricate the deaths are. How does Alex die? He got hit by a brick. Which, I'm like, that's just lazy writing. <laughs> this film is actually written by the two guys who were behind the Ashton Kutcher surprisingly good movie, uh, Butterfly Effect. And the only reason they agreed to write this film was if they could go into production on the Butterfly Effect. So maybe that's why this film is uh, a little more macabre, but also has more of a sick sense of humor, which kind of sets the tone for future films. Now, the original creators did not come back. This one is directed by David R. Ellis, who before this was a known stunt choreographer, so this was his debut uh, directing feature. Unfortunately, he has passed away, and he we only have a few good films that he directed, and this one is actually very favorable. Again, I saw this one in theaters, and it managed to stay shocking, even if you kind of knew what was coming, but that's the thing I appreciate about the series, that they always stay surprising. And this one is, you know, it follows the first film's formula. It's more followed by numbers, but it kind of at least feels like it's something in of itself. It's like the adrenalized, pumped up version of part one. It cuts to the chase and gives you all the stuff you want. It's Final Destination on steroids. So then we have part three, where James Wong and Glenn Morgan come back. And, you know, they don't even follow the rules of their first film. This one is just more like, okay, let's just make some interesting deaths. Now, this one it involves a roller coaster ride. And if I haven't mentioned it till now, these films are mostly Canadian, and you can tell if you know Canadian film and television. And here, you can really feel it. I believe this is the one with Mary Elizabeth Winstead starring. So, you know, future, you know, superstar, early career role. Now this film, Roller Coaster, again, you know, we see the glory, she has visions, she survives, and a whole bunch of other classmates survive. And you know, some are like, you know, pumped up, and I'm never gonna die, uh, this was meant for future glory. But I have to say, this one, they just seem, the deaths don't even seem like they're surprising, but they seem like to linger. So it's like, even in one scene, a girl gets uh, shot by a nail gun in the face. In the face! She's still alive, kicking and lingering, until finally it's like, uh, you know, one of those types of deaths. So it just seems a little mean, uh, but for all of you young guys out there and who care, this is where the films start having a little bit of nudity in them. So, you know, for your, your more exploitation thrills, that's in this film. And then we have part four, the final destination, where David Ellis comes in again. Now this, uh, I don't know if this was supposed to be an ending or a new beginning, because they call this one the final destination. And oh, I forgot to mention in part three, Tony Todd is only in the film voice, as a voice actor, as like the roller coaster. He's the voice, you know, the introduction of the roller coaster. And at the end, a certain character's fate is on a train and he's the conductor's voice. This one, he's not in it at all. So in the back of your mind, you're like, wait, you can't end this. Tony Todd's not here. You got to take who was back in the original. But at this point, it just, again, it feels like, unfortunately, sequel-itis. It's like, okay, what worked in the first two films? Let's just put more of that. And it just doesn't have a distinct personality. It's one of those movies that's great to go see in theaters or maybe even watch it on home video. But of course, after like, you're not really gonna remember it. You might remember the death, but there's nothing special about the film. It's like, it's like how movies try to portray ex-girlfriends. Oh, I remember this one, the one who broke my heart, the one who did this, the one who did that. But then there's that girl who's perfectly fine, but you barely remember her, at, at least film-wise. And I mean, unfortunately, that's what these films start becoming. You still remember the glory of the past series, and that's what they want, and they just give you more of the same. Final Destination. Five, <laughs> I believe. You know, hey, you see, it gets so confusing, they start running alike you don't know. This is pretty impressive because this one is a suspension bridge collapse. You know, sort of think of plant, uh, the remake of the Return of the Planet of the Apes with James Franco. You know, but imagine the worst that could possibly happen when it comes to death and 
destruction. This one also has David Koechner as our resident, hey, I know that guy character actor in a minor role in this. Um, he does what is uh, needed, you know, adds a little bit of com com comedic relief. And you know, I like David Koechner, but you know, he's not the star of this film. This film, now all the films in this series have been linked and this one is no different. And I don't want to ruin it, but this one's ending is rather inventive. Uh, this is the first film where actually a character realized that they're probably on death's list, but to kind of cheat death, they're going to start trying to kill other characters for their own survival. So, I mean, again, at least that's somewhat original, you know, in this series and trying to breathe new life into it. And, you know, that is the episode on the Final Destination series. I think you guys should definitely check the films out, whichever one you want to start with. But, you know, they kind of go from best to worst, from one to five. So I think, you know, you should all give it. And unfortunately, I know we just we just saw each other, but that ends our business for this episode. But remember, there is always more unfinished business out there for us to do and to be done. But before I go, have you guys seen Easy A? If not, why not? Because it's awesome. And with that, I bid you adieu.